I love that video every time. <laughs> Welcome everyone uh, to getting started with Rust, understanding Rust compile errors. Uh, I'm going to give some time for people to join up, but I always like to see where everyone is on their Rust journey. Uh, so please let us know where you're joining us from, where you're joining the stream from, and also your Rust experience level. Like if you, uh, you know, just your first month, maybe your first time seeing Rust, three months in, six months, a year, maybe you've been at since the beginning of Rust in time, or maybe you've accidentally joined the stream because you thought this was about the Rust game. I don't know, Ryan, have you played this Rust game before? I've unfortunately never played Rust, but I have programmed Rust. So that's <laughs> yes, <good. laughs> yes. The first time we did this, I was like, oh, has anyone made any game in Rust? And someone came into the chat and was like, oh, I've played Rust. And I had no idea there was a game called Rust. And then now every time I do like a YouTube search or something, the Rust game shows up now instead of what I'm looking for. Uh, so yeah. that's really, really great. Um, Actually, in the, the Rust official Reddit, uh, there used to be a bot that would detect whether people were posting about Rust the game and send an automatic message saying, you need to go to our play Rust instead of our Rust. Ah, nice. <laughs> okay, that's what I, I do get that message sometimes. So I was like, I thought it was like still another subreddit for Rust, Rust development, but no. Okay, cool. Let's see what we got. We got... Emery Dusseldorf, nice Germany joining, just starting out. That's nice. Well, welcome, uh, welcome. We also got Matthias. First functions. Everyone is, uh, you know, gets getting the touch of Rust, and uh, first time here from Romania. Nice. Thank you for joining. Hello from Israel. Hello, Gil. And programming Rust for fun. I'm glad you're doing for fun, not for pain or <laughs> disappointment misery yeah. misery yeah program for us for misery thanks michael uh for joining from vancouver cool well this is a part of a series um like i said this is our installment of getting started with rust we've done other things and if you've been joining us from the other streams before thank you for uh joining our on uh the other ones we started talking about like building rust projects so what could you do with rust like you know it's an interesting language but what are the applications uh, we also have, um, you know, looking at it uh, from a perspective of Rust basics. So we won't be covering some of the basic, basic stuff, but we're going to be showing you some examples and uh, feel free to ask questions, even if it's your first time seeing Rust code, because we're here to answer those questions as well. And and then we looked at like getting your first Rust job. Like for instance, uh, you know, Michael, he's doing this Rust for fun, but some people want to do Rust for serious play, right? For, for work. Uh, so we had a chat. I uh, was a gentleman, he went from Marcus, who went from Java development to Rust development full time. Uh, so do check that out as well. But the theme of all of those, uh, you know, workshops and presentations we had was all the code worked, or at least hopefully worked uh, <laughs> from what we showed you. But today is going to be different. So we're joined by Ryan. Hello, Ryan. Hello. And he's going to be showing us a lot of code that doesn't work, which is crazy. But fortunately, Ryan's a nice guy. So we're also going to show you how to fix those things. Uh, but before we begin, I need to, I'm going to just show you, you know, you know, I'm working here at Microsoft. I'm very fortunate. I, I have Ryan or I have many other, um, you know, people doing Rust full time and within Microsoft. And I can always ask around if I have a question or get lost or confused. But maybe you don't have a Ryan for, for you. I wish everyone did have a Ryan. Uh, but I think you're know, learning together and it seems like we have some, uh, you know, beginners here. So let's see, Eric, you know, second, it's up to get started with Russ. I don't want to ask about the first time. I won't do that to you here on the stream, but welcome back to Russ, uh, Eric. But, you know, the best reason to learn Rust or learn anything is learning together. So we have created this, uh, Rust ma learners matchmaking. Uh, it's on our tech communities as a reactor, which is something we're piloting. And we've had actually a, a few people last time. I, I normally make the joke that it's like just me talking to myself on this. Uh, but last time, last workshop, we had a few people. So if Eric, Vlad, I see Eric. Oh, Eric, you're here. Great. Uh, Sharif, Mustafa, if you're here, uh, please let us know. Thank you for posting up on you know, your experience and looking up for looking to have other people help out. Uh, but please join up if you're, again, just starting out on your Rust journey. Like I said, meeting people is the best way to do that. So go to this link, aka.ms slash rustme. I will uh, put that in the chat as well. And uh, yeah, post your experience, You know where you're from, where you're, you're coming from for learning languages and like how people can actually find you so uh, you can learn together. 
Speaking of learning, uh, so this will be, again, some of it is going to be maybe more advanced to what you realize, but we have like a prequel, if you will. So uh, to this, which is kind of talking about like panic, uh, options, and when you do with those things and result as far as working with Rust. Uh, so also check that out. I'm going to put that in the chat. Uh, but that's going to be where you can do this lesson, uh, you know, handling errors, and you can really get started with those things. Um, but this will be uh, a, a not a just uh, you know watch the workshop and you know in the tab and you know follow along. We want to uh, actually want to play a game. We want you to participate and sort of guess. Uh, Ryan's going to show a couple of examples uh, that again we know isn't working, but we won't explain exactly why it's not working immediately. Uh, so please in the chat join us and let us know what you think or what's what's wrong with that. And I realize this want to play a game is from the movie Saw. <laughs> I just wanna, but I did not want to put um, like any GIF or anything. So like, you know, the video gets taken down from copyright or anything like that. But this won't be any violence here. It's just going to be about learning Rust. Uh, so cool, Ryan. Uh, let's get started now. That was enough of that. I'm going to put some links on the chat. But now the floor is yours to walk us through some Rust examples. All right. Great. Thanks, Corey. Um, so Again, once again, if you have any questions at any time about what the code does, I, I know we have a couple of, uh, of newcomers to Rust who have maybe uh, not had a chance to really even play around with the language. Some of our later examples will get into the intermediate Rust area. And so if you're really new to the language, it, might, it, um, it can quickly become overwhelming. So make sure you're asking questions, trying to follow along. I think the more you put into this uh, workshop, the more you know, you'll get out of it in the end. Um, so we're just going to look at a bunch of uh, code examples here and see if we can figure out why we're getting these red squiggly lines uh, that uh, Rust Analyzer, uh, which is an extension for VS Code here, is telling us um, this code does not actually compile. It will not compile, and therefore it will not run um, because this code is incorrect um, according to the rules uh, of Rust. So let's dive in. We'll, we'll take a look at, at what's going on here. Um, we have a main function. Uh, of course, which every Rust binary or every Rust program will have a main function. That's where our code starts executing. And then I'm, I want to bring your attention down here to line 20. Um, we have a struct. Uh, this is a custom type called person. Um, and you can think of structs in Rust kind of like classes uh, in other languages. Um, maybe you're coming from a C background where you already have structs or Go where you have structs um, that, that, that's very similar in Rust here. And this, and this person, hobbies, Ryan. I'm just curious. This, I, I mean, I know a little bit about it, but hobbies. It's a, it's a vector. I'm assuming, or vec, or what? What is that? And how? Exactly, exactly. So we have several types here of of, of fields inside of this person. Um, for instance, name is of type string, which you know, if you uh, you're probably familiar with strings, but uh, in Rust, there's a little bit of a, a interesting thing about strings that we'll get into in uh, in a later example. Um, but this hobbies here is, as you indicated, is a, is a vec or a vector, um, which is a growable collection of, of things. So in Rust, you have arrays. Those are fixed size collections of, of things. And vectors are growable. So at runtime, you can add more items to them, um, change the size of, of the vector, um, because arrays and, and Rust are fixed size. They have to always have the same exact size through the entire program. And of course, here we have age uh, as well of the person, um, which we've modeled as a U16. That is a unsigned 16-bit integer. Um, so if you're familiar with uh, languages that care about the size of their uh, of their integer types, um, you may have be a little bit familiar with this. But in Rust, we very much care about what size things are um, because Rust is focused on performance, um, among other things. And so here we we care that it is 16 bits wide. Um, as opposed to 32 bits or 64 bits or even 128 bits. Um, and it's unsigned, meaning this thing cannot be negative. It can only be zero and above. Nice. Um, any, any questions so far on person or what's going on with that? No, it makes sense. Like you said, I mean, the, in the class example, I mean, there's, like you, like you said, there's a, some uniqueness to Rust that maybe from another language, like the U16, like you, you probably don't care as much like oh you can just call it an integer and move on in most languages mm -hmm. uh, so i think that's interesting that yeah you need to care about sort of the bit size here well absolutely i think that's a really important point about rust is that we we do care about a lot of things that in other languages you don't care about um 
the good thing about Rust is, so first of all, the reason we care is because Rust is at the end of the day, a low level language. We want to be able to build things like operating systems, run on embedded devices, things like that. And so for other languages, they kind of, you know, glance over the details because at the end of the day, what they're doing is maybe a little bit more higher level. And if they, if performance suffers a little bit because of that, that's fine. But in Rust, we want control over our program. So we really do have to care about things uh, like that. But the good news is that Rust uh, will prevent us from doing something wrong, which is exactly what this uh, uh, th this workshop today is, is all about is showing that Rust will prevent us from messing up. Um, so we have to care, but if we do it wrong, Rust will tell us. Um, and, and so at the end of the day, nothing really bad can happen. Just our program might not compile. That's all. Good guy, um, Rust. Good guy, yeah, Rust. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Um, so, uh, in our main function here, we, uh, we're instantiating a person. Um, and you can see right here that Rust Analyzer is annotating. I didn't write this colon person right here. That's Rust Analyzer annotating this, um, this declaration here so that we know that Ryan, that's me, um, is of type person. Um, just like down here, we know name is of type string um, right here. And so I'm Ryan, these are my hobbies, coding, cooking, I like to go hiking, um, and I'm 33 uh, years young. Uh, and and so what we're going to do in this main program is print out the name. Um, then we're going to call a function called print hobbies that takes a person and prints all the hobbies uh, for the person. And then finally print the age. Um, this is a question so, here. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, the vector here, like was this dot into, is that, that, is that needed for every, uh, every time you need to add something to the vector or how does that work out? Yeah, so this dot into is 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 getting into a little bit of the the fact that strings and Rust are kind of funny and special, um, and we'll talk even more about this in a later example. Um, but if you uh, hover over one of these string literals here, you'll notice that the type of of those string literals is not capital S string; it's this ampersand str, nice. um, or as we we sometimes call a string slice um, in Rust. And so these are different types of ultimately what is string data, but they are different types of strings. Um, and we can, if you want to, we can get a little bit into why Rust does that. Um, but uh, that is oftentimes a source of confusion for, for newcomers to the language. And so the dot into here says this, this string literal that is of type ampersand stir, amp string slice, let's turn it into a capital S string. Okay. And so dot into does that and, and it knows, okay, you want it to be a capital S string and I'll turn this string slice into a capital S string. Makes sense. Cool. We'll, we'll, we'll be able to, this example right here will really get at the heart of like, why is there a capital S string versus a string slice? Like what, what does this have to do? And it turns out it has to do with a uh, Rust system of ownership and borrowing that this example really gets into the, to the heart of here. So, all right, so um, hopefully you've taken a look at this example. Can, if anybody has any idea like why uh, this example is not compiling, um, why we, we are getting these red squiggly lines and a bunch of error messages that we'll take a look at closely in a second, feel free to write that into chat, um, get your ideas out there. Yeah, take, um, your, take your guesses. No one is going to um, be wrong. I'm not gonna put, well, maybe I will put wrong answers. <laughs> wrong answers only. No, but uh, yeah, I mean, other than, saying that that's a spelling mistake or something, because of course that's not what we're showing you here. Yeah. <laughs> well, you forgot the semicolon. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> let, let, guess away uh, if you want to, um, to see what's, what's going on here. I, I can guess, I think I've seen some of these things, but yeah, um, let's, let's see, let's see. Um, yeah, if we, if we run this, what's the error first? Yeah, <laughs> so I mean, we, now, Rust Analyzer does allow us to see the error messages when we uh, have hover on things. But I think if you're, especially if you're a beginner, it's really great to see what the what the compiler outputs in the terminal because it's much more nicely formatted. Um, Rust Analyzer has to do with some limitations of of VS Code's um, you know uh, UI and stuff like that, so it can't make it quite as pretty as the terminal is. Um, so we're going to go ahead and run this, and the way to run this. Uh, here is going to be using cargo run and we'll type in dash dash example because it's one of the examples in this repo. Um, and the name of the example is move. 
Cool. Um, and then we'll get these these error messages. We've got so, some we'll... guesses here. So what Emery the Brave. Emery, thank you for being the first volunteer. He says we give ownership to print hobbies function and then we try to use it again in main. Exactly. So that's a very good guess. But maybe good you're guess. maybe you're you're new to Rust and you're like, I have no idea what that means. What's yeah. going on here? So let's let's Patrick, take a closer look. One more guess uh, as well. Patrick says Ryan lost his, his name and it's not a type. So you Ryan, you're nameless now. I Rust am days. nameless, yeah. Yeah, that the, man, the, nice. the boy who has no name for Game of Thrones <laughs> reference. Uh, but <laughs> Tell us, Ryan. Let's see what what's the error, and what do you think is what should we fix? <laughs> yeah. So let's uh, first of all, when you're reading errors in Rust, make sure to actually read them. Rust errors are generally not 100 percent of the time, but generally quite good, um, uh, especially if you get to know the vocabulary of of how Rust talks about things. Um, they're usually quite good, so you you want to take the time to actually read through um, what it's uh, what it's telling you. So let's start at the top and go through the bottom. And it says, we're using a partially moved value. And so it says that right here on line seven, our value is partially moved. And then we're using the value after we've partially moved it, okay? So, okay, what does that, what does that mean? Um, if anybody wants to type into the chat about what, what moves are all about, it's kind of hard to, um, to kind of put it into a succinct words. Um, but this is the very, very core of what Rust uh, is talking about. And there's an additional note down here that says the partial move occurs because Ryan.name has type string and string does not implement copy. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. If you're new to Rust, you're kind of like, I'm lost. I don't know what's going on. Copy, here. paste in Google search. Yeah, yeah, what's going <laughs> Immediately. on? Immediately. Yes, and you'll get some good answers on Google for sure. Um, but uh, if we take a look at the code, What's, what's happening here on this line. This is the kind of key to what's going on on line seven. We are trying, we're doing Ryan.name and trying to store that into a new variable called name here, right? And in Rust, when you do this, you know, variable name dot field name syntax, it performs a move on that value. And what is a move? Well, the best way to think about it is, that essentially you're reaching into this Ryan value and you're ripping out the name from it. You're, you're sort of ripping it out. You can really, uh, the way I visualize it is really as like yeah. taking the name and kind of like removing it. <laughs> that is a visual that I wish I could, I'm gonna record that and make a GIF out of this ripping yeah. out thing. <laughs> we'll see that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that's all well and good. That's possible to do in Rust. Rust allows you to do that. But once you rip something out of the thing, you can't use the thing anymore. It's sort of in an invalid state now. So we've ripped out name and Ryan is, you know, this Ryan person is unfortunately kind of limping around without a name in it. And then we try and pass Ryan to print hobbies. But print hobbies down here, this function, expects a person, a full person, a person that has a name and it has hobbies and has, he has an age uh, and things like that. But we've ripped out name from this Ryan. We've moved name out of it. And so we can't pass Ryan anymore. And that's exactly what this error message is saying. Hey, you've, you've partially moved, you've ripped out a piece of this, of this Ryan value, you've ripped out the name. And then you're trying to use that, that value after this partial move, after this ripping out of the, of the value. Um, so that, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. And then you, you might be wondering, okay, well, what the heck does this line here mean then? I understand we're, we're, we're moving the name out, out of Ryan. We can't use Ryan anymore because we've ripped his name out and stuff like that. That might make sense. But it's saying, okay, the partial move occurs here because Ryan.name has type string and string does not implement copy. What does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, the important thing to know with that is that the name field here is a string. It's a, you know, it's a, a whole bunch of memory inside of your computer. Uh, there's a bunch of machinery around, like we've allocated some memory and stuff like that. This thing, we do not want to copy this thing without explicitly copying it. Um, and so normally when we, I said, when we do, you know, just type like variable type dot field thing here, we're performing a move. That's only true if this thing is not trivially copyable. 
Got it. And the way we indicate that in Rust is through the, this copy trade. And what do I mean by trivial, trivial, trivially copyable? Well, what I mean by that is if we go up here and change this, sorry, oops, I've got to learn how to type real quick. Um, if we do dot age here, we no longer get that error message. That error message has disappeared. We have a different error message down here instead, um, but we'll we'll talk about that in just a second. That's because this, this U16 here does implement copy. And why does it implement copy? Because copying a 16-bit integer is cheap. So as, as almost to be effectively free, um, it's very, very cheap to do. And so Rust allows you to do that. So when we call Ryan.age here, we're not ripping out the age anymore like we were with name. We're not, you, we're not doing the ripping out of the value. Instead, we're just copying the value. So, so age cheap, stays cheap moves are okay in Rust. Cheap moves. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Once the price um, goes up, you need to, exactly. you need to make, some, make some considerations. I like this. I like this thought. Exactly. So, so the important thing to remember is when a value is cheap to copy, it implements this copy uh, trait, and therefore this dot syntax here doesn't perform a move, it performs a copy instead. And for those who are coming from C++ background, you're probably like, okay, I understand this is, this, you know, stood move versus copy. In C++, it's sort of the opposite. In C++, everything is basically copy by default, and you have to explicitly move things. In Rust, it's the other way around. In Rust, everything is moved by default um, unless you can copy it. Um, and so, uh, so Ryan is still totally intact here because we copied age into name here. So those are two different integers now and in, in, on the stack. Everything's fine here. And we can pass Ryan into print hoppies, no problem. Um, and in fact, I think if we just comment that line up there, then everything this is this compiled now. This can run, and in fact, let's go ahead and run it. Um, we'll run oh, it. We'll truth. get some warnings or whatever, but we'll see. It actually prints out the eight. Well, it says my name is thirty-three because we changed from doing age to or from name to age. But um, the the program at least runs now. Any any questions so far? Thoughts? Comments? So I guess Patrick was the closest here um, that you've lost your name. So I don't know. I have no um, award for you, Patrick, but thank you. <laughs> uh, maybe one day if I ever meet, I will give you a strong handshake. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think also the way that, that Patrick put it there of like um, that it's, you know, that I've lost my name is like really how you should think about it. Like yeah. uh, when we, when we do this, like Ryan, this Ryan no longer has a name anymore. It really has been, it's not lost per se. It's, you know, it's, it's stored over here in this name variable uh, now instead. Um, so, so now we're back to getting this error message, right? We're ripping name out and we can't pass Ryan to print hobbies anymore because Ryan's not complete. So what if you wanted to get this to compile without changing, you know, I want to print the name out here and I want to pass Ryan into print hobbies, how would I, how would I do that? Like, how does that work then? What should I do here? Any thoughts on, on how we can kind of rearrange this code to get it to compile and, and actually print out the right thing? Give back Ryan's name. While we wait for some good guesses here, Patrick, I'm expecting you to give us a, the solution as well as you have pointed out the problem. Uh, maybe you can go a little bit more around copy uh, we have uh, meet the requirements. Says a little, still a little lost. I think the ripping part is just in my head. I'm just keep seeing you doing that. But uh, but uh, we have. But this is coming from JS too, so it's it's probably a little bit trickier also to get some of these concepts. Yeah, in the world of JS. But yeah, I think that's a good point uh, to look at. But we do have some guesses too. But if you want to talk a little bit more about copy first, yeah, then, sure. Uh, we can learn. Sure. I mean, and so coming from JavaScript, you, you're coming from a language with a garbage collector where memory is being managed by the garbage collector. And so when does the memory get freed and all that is something that you as a programmer have never really had to be concerned with because JavaScript has a runtime that takes care of it for you. In Rust, we unfortunately don't have that luxury. We are effectively doing manual memory management here, just assisted by a compiler who catches our mistakes for us. Um, and so the question you have to ask yourself for every value and every piece of, of a value here is who owns the memory? Who's in charge of the memory right now? 
when will this memory be freed? So for instance, this hobbies vector right here, this is allocating memory onto the heap where, where uh, if, you, if you're familiar with heap versus the stack, heap is effectively this big chunk of, of memory inside of your computer and we can allocate stuff onto it um, that lives longer than the function that we're currently in. Um, the stack is the, basically just the function call that we're in and the memory there will be uh, will be deallocated or no longer available after the function that we're currently in is uh, returns from. So in Rust, we really got to we got to ask ourselves when is when is this memory going to be free? Like this this hobbies vector, when is that? When are we actually going to free that memory from uh, and and allow the memory to be um, returned so that other pieces of the program or other programs on the computer can use that memory? And in oh, yeah. Rust. Go ahead. I was going to say, I hope this meets the requirements as a play on the name. Yeah. Uh, but we did, we, get the, we did get some guesses here um, or some answers. So we have one who is my all time favorite person. He's, I think you've joined all of the streams, one, and, and, and tried to answer all of the questions too. So I appreciate you, one. It says, make a clone of it. Matias says, copy. And Andrew, Andrew, by the way, love the photo, Andrew. Uh, borrow it. So I think this is like the beg, borrow, and steal of <laughs> all options exactly. of Rust. Or for a first question for me, uh, are all these things the same thing? Clone, copy, borrow. What are the differences, and which one would you say is right here in the, in this case? Yeah. Okay. So uh, clone, clone, copy, and borrow are uh, three aspects of the same system that work together in very in harmony with with each other. Right. So just going back to what we uh, what we have been doing so far, again, we have this Ryan value. It in Rust parlance owns this hobby vector. So it is in charge of the vector of hobbies. When it goes out of scope, when it's no longer needed, it will deallocate hobbies on your behalf. So it goes ahead and at the very end of this function, the, the person, Ryan, is no longer needed. And at the end of the function, hobbies will be automatically, the compiler inserts this code for us. It automatically frees the hobbies vector uh, for us. So Ryan owns um, uh, owns name, uh, Ryan owns hobbies, and Ryan owns uh, H here. Nice. And on line seven, what we're doing here is we're calling dot name. And what that does, what a move is, it says, Ryan owned name before, but we're going to move ownership from Ryan into this name variable now. So Ryan no longer owns this name string. The name variable owns it instead. And so when name goes out of scope, it's responsible for making sure that that string is deallocated and things like that. All right. So what we're effectively doing here in, in Rust parlance when we're getting this compiler error message is saying, you're trying to pass a person to print hobbies, but we've already moved a piece of, of ownership of that uh, of that value to another variable instead. And so when person at the end of print hobbies goes out of scope and it frees its memory, it will it will look at name, try and free it. But hey, that memory has already been freed because it was owned by somebody else instead. And you end up with a classic error in C and C++ programming of a double free. And Rust prevents us from, from doing that. So everything in Rust is owned by one thing. And when that thing goes out of, of scope, it frees the memory associated uh, with it. So we've been talking about how do we fix this? Clone, borrowing, copy, and things like that. Let's start with clone and copy. Clone and copy are the same, sort of the same thing at the end of the day. What the difference between clone and copy is, is that copy is an implicit thing that happens. Remember when we uh, we said that U16 is uh, this, this value down here, age is copy. That's just U16s are copy. We don't have to explicitly copy the value here. Rust does that automatically. That's what copy types are. They get copied automatically because they're so cheap. And effectively, that's how you think of copy types is whatever is cheap to copy implements copy. And copying a number is very, very cheap. It's it's one instruction, one, in one assembly instruction. So it's really, really not that big of a deal. However, Rust, when we do ryan.name here, 
Rust does not copy name into the name variable because copying a, a string is pretty expensive. That's a heap allocated value. That thing, if we copy it, it will have to allocate on the heap again. That's a call to the allocator. Uh, we have to move a whole bunch of values. Uh, we have to copy a whole bunch of values over and stuff like that. So that's like, we're talking about dozens and dozens of assembly instructions right here to do that. We don't rust. We don't want Rust to do that on our behalf. We want to be explicit about copying things. Makes sense. But we can be explicit, and that's through clone. So here we call clone, and now effectively we are doing exactly that. This line here will take will not rip out name from Ryan. Instead, what it will do is take all the memory that Ryan is composed of, the heap allocated string there, and make a new heap allocation. It will allocate new memory. It will look at Ryan and copy every single letter inside of the Ryan string over to this new heap allocation. So now there are two strings with Ryan inside of them. And the good thing about this is that Rust is basically forcing us to be very explicit about our, our copies, our, our, our clones here. So that's the difference between clone and copy. Copy is implicit. It only happens when things are very, very cheap and Rust just does it for us. Whereas clone is when we're allowed to copy, but that copying is expensive enough that we want to be explicit about it and have to actually call the dot clone method in order to, to perform that, that cloning. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Uh, audience, let us know. So I think, I mean, so the cloning looks like a, a, a good way to fix this, would you say? or? Yeah, I'd say that, you know, in, in a lot of beginners to Rust uh, hear about things like lifetimes and borrowing and all these fancy yeah, yeah. things, and that Rust is a low-level language and, like, therefore, like, I want to avoid, you know, clone, like, copying memory and stuff like that. Um, so they avoid actually calling these explicit clone methods here. And an advanced Rust programmer may be like, nah, that's that's fine to do, or really, honestly, intermediate Rust programmers are the ones that tend to be very like concerned about copying memory. Advanced Rust programmers kind of learn to like just live with copying. It's fine. Um, so this is fine to do, and I would encourage you when you're learning and you run into uh, an error message where you're talking about moving values and stuff like that, don't be afraid to clone memory. Like most languages you use, do this automatically, implicitly for you. So if you do it in Rust, it's doesn't make your program slow. It's just ever so slightly slower and ever so slightly more memory intensive. But we're talking on a very, very minute scale here. So this is fine. I would say this is a great way to solve this. But in this particular case, I don't think this is how I would solve it myself. Uh, uh, I was gonna give I was gonna give one the strong handshake award. But I mean, so you get the strong handshake one, but not the Ryan handshake. So Ryan, how would you do this then? <laughs> so I would probably avoid cloning here and instead use the other mechanism that has been mentioning, mentioned, and that's borrowing. So we talked about moving, that's like ripping okay. things out of, of a value um, or cloning, that's not ripping it out, but instead saying, okay, hold on a second, let me take like a photocopy of that piece of, of memory and I'll, I'll have my own piece of memory that looks just like it, that's fine. What borrowing does instead is say, I don't own the thing over there, that piece of memory over there, but I'm just gonna like refer to it. I'm gonna like point to it and say, hey, that thing over there, like I'm referring to that thing over there. And that's what borrowing is. It's if you're coming from a C and C++ background, this is pointers essentially. Um, so if you have experience there and in Rust, we have references, which are essentially just like pointers at the end of the day, but a whole heck of a lot smarter. And what we can do instead here is put an ampersand at the front here. And you'll notice that the type just changed from capital S string to ampersand capital S string. And what that means is we're no longer, we no longer have ownership over the this memory. Instead, we're just borrowing it. We're just saying, hey, we're gonna we're gonna refer to it instead. And now this compiles just fine. Why does it compile just fine? Because when we use name, we're borrowing it. And when we pass Ryan to print hobbies, which expects a full person with name intact, it is intact because we borrowed name. We didn't rip it out of, of Ryan in, instead. 
So this compiles just fine. And this is probably uh, how I would end up solving uh, this issue instead. Okay, it pains me to say, but Andrew, yes, you are the winner of this one. Uh, <laughs> but since I've met you personally, Andrew, maybe a strong handshake for me is not even an award that you want. So <laughs> one gets the, the Corey handshake and Ryan, Andrew gets the Ryan handshake for this one. <laughs> Very cool. cool. So we, we have one unfortunate piece here though, is that if we uncomment this code here, again, we end up with another compiler error message. Let's take a look at what it says here. So we're sort of back to where we were before. Um, we have a borrow of a moved value. So we are borrowing the value here on line 10. That's what happens. Print line borrows all of its, uh, all of its values. Um, you might be, be wondering why is this thing not copied? That's because the print line macro does some magic and never, never moves values. It always borrows them. Um, so this is this is a little bit of, of rust syntactical magic here. This is actually a borrow that's happening right here. You can imagine that there's actually an ampersand in front of here. Um, that's a little bit of a, a learning wart, but that's how uh, print line works. Um, and what we have done on line nine is we've, we've moved Ryan into the print hobbies function. And then on line 10, afterwards, we tried to use Ryan again, but we already moved Ryan. We ripped Ryan out of the current function and passed it over to print. To, we ripped Ryan out of the main function and passed Ryan into the print hobbies function. Ryan is no longer usable from the main function. It has been moved from the main function into the print hobbies function. And if we try and use it again, the compiler will yell at us and say, you are using something that has already been moved. Can't do that. So how do we solve this? Any ideas? Yeah, this is your, your time to redeem yourself, everyone who has maybe not guessed correctly, or it's your time to shine. Like, I know there's people here that are just holding all this knowledge within. Uh, well, well, let's take some guesses here. I'm going to go ahead and put this link up for the, the repo as well. Um, <clears throat> so don't get nervous. So this has uh, the repo that Ryan is showing, as uh, well as the matchmaking link, the, the learn link. So um, you can see this code on, on your side as well. Uh, but let's see what we got here. So one is still, he's still very much focused on cloning. So now is the time to clone. Um, Emery said, borrow again. I love that. I love that consistency. Like, okay, maybe we just borrow again. And um, Patrick, he's back here with a good guess. So print hobbies should use a, as a reference. I like it. Three, I like it three solid answers. Three com I feel I can feel the confidence in the answers that they provided. So Let's see, what is your take, Ryan? What, which, what's the best method? Well, uh, I think all of them are good. We, we heard two things, basically. One was, let's clone. Um, and two was, let's change print hobbies to take a, a reference to, to borrow person instead. And I think these are both perfectly acceptable answers. So we could clone Ryan like this. We're getting another compiler error message. We'll talk about that in just a second. And this will work once we get this line to do. So instead of ripping Ryan from the main function and passing Ryan into print hobbies, we're going to clone Ryan. So now there are two Ryans, one who lives in the main function and one who gets passed into print uh, print hobbies. This will work just fine. Um, we don't, it does not compile because when we run it, you can see there is no, Ryan does not implement clone. There is no clone method uh, for Ryan. Um, the note here helps quite a lot. It says the following trait defines an item clone. Perhaps you need to implement it. So the clone trait implements this method clone. Perhaps you want to implement clone. And that's very easy to do. In Rust, you can just go down here and say, I want to derive clone. And that will implement clone uh, automatically by saying, I'll just clone every single field of the person. Uh, that's, that's fine to do. And this works just fine now. So we are, again, instead of ripping Ryan from the main function and passing him into print hobbies, we are cloning Ryan. There are two Ryans now. One stays in the main function, and one gets passed into print hobbies. That's totally fine to do. So cloning, great, works. This is ever so slightly inefficient, though, because we are cloning this memory. We're going to be copying the string. We're going to be copying the vector. A lot of, of memory allocation will happen because of this. So for our example, fine to do. Uh, but you know, if you're worried about performance for uh, for another program, 
you may not want to clone. And instead, what we can do is exactly what was suggested by others, and that is borrow person in the print hobbies uh, function. So here, print hobbies will take a borrowed person. It doesn't need ownership of person. It doesn't need us to pass in a, a, a person that's ripped from somebody where else. We just need to say, hey, there's a person over there. We're gonna refer to it. We're good and we're just borrowing it instead. And this works fine, except we have one compiler error message left to deal with. And that is, we expected an ampersand person, but found struct person. And then there's a very helpful message here. It says, hey, consider borrowing here. Um, That's clear. Should, That's it, super clear now. <laughs> yeah. We're taking we all should, this stuff to find that one, we're like, boom, that's what we need yes. to do. <laughs> yes. Uh, and in fact, the compiler is being a little bit modest here. It's not that we should consider borrowing here. Like we, Definitely we must it. borrow here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and so we put that ampersand there to borrow Ryan um, and everything works except wait, no, it doesn't. Why is that? Okay. Let's take a look at the next error message here. Oh, we're moving again. Remember when we said that type dot field name moves the value we don't want to move here and we can't move here because you cannot move you can't rip things out of something that you're borrowing like imagine if you borrowed a book and you just rip pages out of it that's not nice you don't want no. to do that no not that i've never no. done that before but yeah no yes yeah but you shouldn't do it and the compiler the compiler is very 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 uh considerate of other people's property and so will not allow you to rip things out of uh things that are owned by others so the compiler is going to be very helpful uh, here as well. Well, this person says you can't move person.hobbies because it's behind a shared reference. So it's behind this ampers, this reference that we have. Um, and person.hobbies is moved due to an implicit call to dot into iter. And that's because in for loops, when we do a for loop here, person and we this value here, implicitly we call dot into iter uh, on it. That's just the, what for loops get syntactically desugared into. And person.hobbies has type vec string, and vec string does not implement copy because, again, copying vectors is very expensive. So, very expensive. and we yeah. only implement copy for things that are very, very cheap to copy. So, we don't uh, do that here. So, how do we solve this? Well, luckily, we get a very nice helpful message from the compiler saying, consider once again, iterating over a slice of vec strings content to avoid moving into the for loop. And it tells us exactly what that means. We want to borrow person.hobbies instead of moving hobbies out of person. Okay. So right here, we can do that. And in fact, Rust Analyzer understands these messages so well that if I do control, peer, or, sorry, I'm on a Mac, command period here, you can see that I can rewrite this. Uh, oh no, sorry. I, I made a mistake. Somebody needs to implement that. The um, the uh, Rust analyzer should be able to know that we need to put a ampersand here. Uh, apparently that's not been implemented. So anybody wants to, to implement that, that's a great uh, way to contribute to the Rust analyzer. Open extension. source, contribute to open source. This is it. Yeah. And there we go. We're now borrowing person.hobbies instead of ripping it out, instead of moving hobbies out of person. And now everything works. The hobby went from being a string to an ampersand string, but we're fine. We can copy, we can copy borrowed strings just fine here. So this all works. And finally, we have a working solution that's actually quite uh, efficient. We're not copying things that we shouldn't be copying. Everything is working just, just fine. So congrats, Emery, on borrow again being the right answer, as is the test here in Rust, the answer is always C, or the answer is always borrow in most yeah. cases, I guess. And so we'll see. Cool. Yes. I think that's a really great thing to, <laughs> to think is try borrowing um, if you can. You probably want to try borrowing. But if you start going, I can't get this to work, or I don't understand why it's not working, or it makes my code very hard to understand when trying to use borrows and stuff like that, then go to clone. And, and just you know don't worry about it too much, because at the end of the day, cloning while it's more expensive than borrowing often, uh, or most of the time, it's it's not that expensive. And most of the time we can just get away with clones. They're they're usually not that bad. Love it, Emery. There's the, hand, uh, there's the handshake. 
No, I, I feel bad. This is for everyone else who also got the handshakes. Because I haven't physically done that. But yes. Cool. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna spoil it here because Ryan has prepared, I think was it six of these uh exercises. And we're already like 45 minutes in. I think maybe we'll have time to do one more, but this is great information. So maybe we'll do like a sequel uh to this because I think one, you've yeah. already set it up the code and we need to the people want this. So um we'll definitely do it. So let's let's try one more. Um Aaron cool. message here and we can see I love all the guesses so this is this is good maybe we'll get like a perfect record at this time okay this one is this one's pretty pretty involved so um, but this is really going to get at the absolute core of, of borrowing um, in, inside of Rust so um, this is a much more complicated example we'll take it a little bit slower uh, to explain the code um, the first thing that we're going to be doing here is we're dealing with a pantry of food. So we have a, a collection of food and we're going to be going to the grocery store and stocking our pantry. Um, we're going to be making some, some guacamole today because I love guacamole. Who doesn't? Um, yeah, who doesn't? Let us know in the chat if you don't so I can uh, yeah. <laughs> not, not remove you. I would never remove anyone, but I just want to see if there's varying opinions on the guacamole. <laughs> Yeah, of course, you know, some people are allergic to avocados. Yeah, there you go. That's fine. But, uh, but still, uh, guacamole, great. Um, so, so we have this enum here, which in, in Rust, you have enums like in other languages, except they can have data associated with one of their variants, like we have here. So we have food, and there are, in this world, we have three things of food. We have avocados and the number of avocados that, that you want to buy. We have chips, which is just a collection of chips, and we have cake, and that's it. That's all we got in this in this world. And in our main function, what we're going to do is our pantry is going to start with just three avocados, and then we're going to pass our pantry to the stock function, and the stock function knows how to look at our pantry and go ahead and stock it with more food. All right. I'm curious, Ryan. In this example, uh, so the last one you did, you did use a struct. And in this case, you're using an enum. Like, <clears throat> why and, and like, what's the approach there? What what do we lose or gain from using an enum? Yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, enums are really great when you want to model something where it's like it's either this thing or it's this thing or it's this other thing. So in our example, food is like it's either avocados or it's chips or it's cake. If it's cake, it's not chips. And if it's cake, it's not avocados. Like it's one or the hopefully, other. Hopefully. I mean, yeah, no one's eating hopefully. avocado cake out there, but yeah. uh, you yeah, never know. Know. maybe you could can be a trend. It, yeah, <laughs> not in this world. We're not doing this in this world. So yeah. uh, so so enums are really great at that kind of like uh, the that um, either or type of modeling, whereas structs are an and type relationship. So if we real quick, we're going back to person um, in here. So a person is not an, you know, it's not a person is not a name or hobbies or age. A person is a name and hobbies and age. Got so it. when you, when you think about how you're modeling something, if it, if you want to like collect data together, use a struct. And if you want to discriminate, uh, the, these are called actually discriminated unions. If you want to say it's either this or that, then you use an, uh, an enum instead. Nice. Makes sense. Cool. Okay, so what does this code, this stock function actually do? It looks, it looks somewhat complicated here. Um, and what it's doing is it's taking the pantry, it's iterating over that pantry with this iter mute function here. It's, it's iterating through it and it's iterating through it in a mutable way. So a way that allows us to mutate um, items inside of the, uh, of the pantry. And then we're calling dot find here and what we're doing with dot find is saying, find me the food item that is an avocado. It uses this matches thing here. And what that says is if F in this case looks like avocados, like it's an avocados uh, variant of this enum, not chips, not cake, then return true and find will find that item here. And what find does is return back an optional thing. So it returns back sum with the item if it found it. That's this variant right here. And it returns back none if we didn't find it. So essentially- Matches, sorry, it's built into Rust or is that something yeah. extra? 
yes, this is built into the standard library right here. You can create your own matches macro. There's nothing really special about it. Um, but uh, essentially all it does is just look for this variant. And if it, if it matches that variant, if it looks like that variant, then it will return true and otherwise it returns false. This is why I love Rust. I mean, I feel like I would have to write a whole function or something just to do this in other languages. And like one, it says matches, so you know what it does <laughs> and it's built in, you, it's very clear. So yeah, it's, it, that's, just want to highlight that ladies and gentlemen, that's a good, good point. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so in this case, what we're doing is we're matching and saying, okay, if we get back some avocados from, if we actually find some avocados here and avocados, uh, if the number of avocados is greater than zero, then we'll go ahead and do this. We'll push, we'll put some chi uh, chips into our pantry and we'll double the number of avocados that we have here. So that's just it. Like if we got some avocados, let's make guacamole. We're going to get some chips and we're going to like get even more avocados because like we want lots of avocados and that's what our logic is. And otherwise, like if we don't have any avocados, we'll, we'll like, could we'll make it up by just buying some cake instead. Right. Salty or sweet do. or salty and sweet. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's uh, exactly. I like it. I exactly. Like it. <laughs> but this code doesn't apply. Like we get some, we got some uh, definite like squiggly red lines going on here. Does anybody have any yeah, ideas? You know, what's, it's, what's going it's wrong? guessing time now. Uh, I'm not keeping score, but I think it's like for the guesses, I think everyone has a point for who has, has tried to guess so far. Um, so let us know. Let us know what you think. Why is why can I not double the amount of avocados for chips, or why can't I eat cake? And maybe don't say it's because like I want to diet or something, because that's <laughs> not until January. I'm not going to make those commitments. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and just to be clear, there are there's two uh, two issues with this code. Um, so we got to find both issues in order to get this to compile. So that you could be either doubly right if you guess. Or doubly wrong, doubly yeah. not not right, not right, not wrong. It's not right. <laughs> or half and half, you know, maybe, half and half. Maybe yeah, yeah. You, one. you, there's, there's like, what is it? Bonus or like half credit here? I remember in school, like you get half credit for things, and that was the the number one thing you can always aim for. Uh, but cool. While we, while people are scratching their head, I can hear them collectively thinking about it. I'm going to go ahead and where's that link for the matchmaking? Oh, I lost it. Yes, here we are. Rust matchmaking. So again, everyone seems to be learning on a different path on your journey. Uh, so we again, we make this forum, like old school 90s, in early 2000 forum, uh, where you can post what your experience is, find other people, so people probably in, in this chat or in our previous streams, and uh, connect, find them, learn together. It's the best way, I think, to, to be learning in Rust. There's so many resources out there, but connecting people is also the trick. So uh, feel free to go there. So let's see. Uh, oh yeah, that's a good point. We actually didn't show the error message, Ryan. Yeah, we, let's uh, do that. Clever, clever. So now we'll see the the error message. But Andrew confidently has already guessed. So we want to we're gonna put his guess up there. So is food actually mutable? So is food, that's a, that's a good one. So is food actually mutable? Let's real quick since that was before we looked at the error message. Um, so. Food uh, is mutable because the vector of food is mutable as, as indicated right here because we're mutably borrowing our pantry. So everything, when you mutably borrow something, everything inside of that thing is also transitively mutable. And in fact, you can see here that F inside of our, our, our closure that we're passing to the find function here is, uh, uh, well, is a reference to a mutable uh, food, but we're, we don't need to, to mutate it um, currently in here. What we do is we need to, uh, we just need to mutate pantry and pantry is mutable here. So, so yes, it is, but there's probably an easier one to, to fix. And in fact, uh, the, the compiler is being very, very helpful with us. Uh, so we're, this is the first one to take care of. Pa Patrick is picking up the low-hanging avocado here uh, <laughs> and, and putting non-exhaustive pattern. Yes, can you explain yes. what that means actually um, to to everyone? Like, uh, I mean, before you fix it, at least let us know what that. 
Exactly. Okay, cool. So we have this non-exhaustive pattern um, and it's in fact showing us like uh, we're not covering this sum variant here. So there's a there's a variant here called sum of, of option that we're not covering. And in fact, it even says maybe you want to do, you want to add something uh, here. And I, I want to try maybe Rust Analyzer will be no be friendly no oh come on <laughs> unfortunate that's that's a shame i think it's because yeah there's i'm sorry anybody who's working on rust analyzer who's like ah all of this stuff works except for like the two cases that you yeah, have yeah you're to showing um, way to go thanks ryan <laughs> uh, so um so essentially we have we have many possibilities of what uh the what fine can return back to us um it can return back none, we're covering that uh, point. It can return back some where the item is in avocados and the number of avocados is greater than zero. But what happens if it returns back avocados where n is zero? Like we're not covering that case. And in fact, the, 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 the type system doesn't know like logically that we only can get back avocados from this function because that's what find does here. It's not quite smart enough to know that. So on a type system level, what happens if we return, if we get back uh, some cake or some chips or something like that? So there's a whole another, um, there's a whole set of different possibilities that our match expression here is not covering like what hap what happens if we get back something that's not none and not some avocados where there there are more than zero of them so we have to cover that that possibility we have to say what to do uh in that case now what we could do think about what we could do here what's 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 the right thing to do uh in this case do the right you may thing. say I don't know, maybe we want to, if we reach, you know, some avocados where it's zero, we also want cake, right? Instead, we'll treat it the same as if we get none. Um, so, you know, we could, we could do that. We can do something like, uh, well, we could do some food, avocados. So this is every other time that we get avocados back, then we'll just do the same thing. We'll push pantry dot push food cake here. So this sort of works, but we're still missing the possibility of what happens if we get back chips, what happens if we get back uh, cake instead. So probably the best thing to do is just say, if we get back anything else besides some avocados, let's just push cake on. And that's what this underscore means here. This is effectively the, the else um, pattern here. Anything else, doesn't matter what it is, we'll go ahead and run this code right here and push uh, cake on into our pantry. So that's how I would solve it. And we have a question. Um... So first, I like this from one, do nothing. That's a, always an option. You can always mm -hmm. just... Leave your computer. No, um, yeah. <laughs> but I don't know if you know this with um, JS, but <clears throat> yeah, if you do like a switch statement, you have like a default option. Mm -hmm. How does that work out in, in Rust? Or if you could quickly show that because apparently there is, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is effectively the default option. So if you want to, to uh, mimic default, then you just say this underscore pattern just says anything else. Anything else that we get back will default then to running this instead so there is no there is no default keyword or anything like that in rust yeah. um instead we have we use underscore uh for that nice like that um what i think uh i think uh one was talking about doing doing nothing that is a possibility we could say like this we could say if it's none push cake in and otherwise we'll go ahead and literally do nothing this also works. So this this right here is effectively an empty code block. It just is a block of code with no code in it, and so that's exactly what we're doing here. We are we are doing ap absolutely nothing um, if we reach that case. 
Um, another way to, to write this as well is, whoops, like this. So here we can say, instead of if anything else happens, we know that the only thing else that can happen is getting back some with something inside. And so we can use this underscore pattern in, in various places to indicate we don't care what happens, what, what is filling that uh, this void right here. We just, if it's some and then anything, doesn't matter what it is, go ahead and do nothing. Does that make sense? Sometimes the best thing is to do nothing, as they yeah. say. So yeah, none. I'll give you. I'll give you that handshake there. That's uh, that's one for you then. Do nothing. I didn't see that coming, as an option. Um, and then there was also a point about the first error. I know. We, I think we had two errors the first time, um, and it was yeah something to do with an optional. Yeah, I think that's what they're referring to is what we just uh, what Next we error, just yeah. fixed here. Yeah. <laughs> so so we really only have one one error left. Let's take a look at what it is. Okay, this has to do with uh, with borrowing and stuff like that. So we it's, let's let's read through this error um, together here. So it says we cannot borrow pantry as mutable more than once at a time. So we're borrowing pantry as mutable here. This call right here. Dot iter mute borrows pantry mutably, and then. We're also borrowing it mutably by trying to push onto it. And then the, the real key here is that we are, uh, we're still using this first borrow on line 10 right here. So I'll explain why that is in just a second. But if anybody can start thinking about how do we solve this issue, go ahead and write it in chat because this is going to be a, this is a subtle one. I love this example because the answer cannot be borrow this time. Yes, because the borrowing <laughs> so, is the problem. Yeah. So Emery, sorry if you're going to use that as your go-to because borrowing is now the problem. It used to be the solution. Uh, what is that quote? It's like you live long enough to be, see yourself the villain or whatever. Yeah, hero thing. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is borrow's, borrow's moment. So let's, let's talk a little bit about why why, what it's when it's saying, um, oops, sorry, when it's saying here that the first borrow later used here. So our first borrow is being used on line 10, but the first borrow happens up here. Like what, what, what does that mean? I don't really get that. Let's, let's, let's walk through that. Okay. So we have pantry right here. We're borrowing pantry mutably with this dot iter mute that's happening here. And effectively that borrow lasts all through this call to find. We're still borrowing pantry mutably through here, borrowing mutably. Then when we get um, to line eight here, we see that we have some avocados. We're borrowing pantry mutably still. And we're even using a piece of that pantry that we've mutably borrowed when we when we update the number of avocados here when we double them. So we we have taken this this borrowed uh, uh, this mutable borrow here and it's sort of followed us all along as we're iterating through items as we get avocados and all the way to allow us to double the number of avocados that we have. That's what is. Um, that is, is what's causing this issue is that we are borrowing this the whole time while on line nine, we try and borrow pantry again by pushing chips uh, into it. So any, any thoughts on how to, to fix this issue? My guess is we just move line 10 above line nine. Could that? You are, you are smart. I like that. <laughs> That's good. Um, That's the problem. Spoiler alert, that's the correct answer. Oh, um, my. It could be that simple. Oh, wow. Yeah. One, you're a little, I mean, there's a delay on the chat. So, I mean, I'll, I'll say me and one, we coordinated there. We, we text each other yes, in back rows. Yes. But uh, yes. All right. But we do have this other alternative. Maybe see if this works. Can we do n.push? So, like, I guess pushing the double. Well, well remember, 
n right here, all n is is a mutable borrow to a number to this to this number of avocados that we have right here. So we can't we can't push anything onto a number, right? That that wouldn't work. There is no push operation on numbers. All all n is is a is is just a lonely sixteen bit integer, um, and it doesn't know anything about an operation called push. So that that doesn't quite uh, make sense. Um, well, to build up some intuition about what's going on here, in fact, you can you can comment this line out right here, and everything compiles just fine. So really, what we're seeing here is that the code that deals with avocados and doubling the number and stuff like that, that's all fine. That, that works fine. What the issue is, is that while we're trying to double the number of avocados, we also try and uh, push something onto pantry. And we can't do that. Now, does anybody have any idea, like, if this code were allowed, if this code right here were allowed to compile, what could possibly happen? Because this, if this code were allowed to compile, like, you you would actually corrupt memory. This is this is like really Chaos. this isn't this isn't Rust being pedantic. This is just this is just wrong. Okay. Well, while we get some guesses, I'm gonna give myself a self handshake. By the way, I forgot. Yeah, like... there we go. You deserve it. <laughs> But yeah. nine and ten, that was actually in the dark, shot in the dark. But that's what really well well explained it with the borrowing. I, I like that. Like, yeah, you're like, it's it's you know you're tracing through the code. Like, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay until it's you need to find out when it's not okay or when you've done something or tried it again. Uh, I mean, it's great here in the examples. I'm sure, I'm I'm wondering because I mean I've worked with you know these like small code bases, code snippets, things like this. But like, how is a good way to sort of do that in large, large, a large code base, like track that. Yeah. I mean, the, the, good, the nice thing about, uh, about Rust is all of this reasoning about borrows and stuff like that happens locally inside of the function. So the nice thing is you're, you're dealing with sort of, yeah, these fun examples of, you know, a pantry or whatever that yeah. no one would actually write this in a production code base. But the, the issues we're running into here are the same exact kind of issues you run to at a huge code base, a code base of hundreds of millions of lines of code, because all of the reason, all the compiler does borrow checking at the function level. Got it. it doesn't, you don't have to worry about two functions borrowing between each other and stuff like that. Um, it all happens at the, at the function level. So if you can figure out what's happening here in this little code snippet, then you can debug effectively a, a code base the size of the Rust compiler as well. Um, so Emery had to your question, you can delete the number of avocados before multiplying them below. What What do you mean by delete? Do you mean Don't free? Delete the we need guacamole, Emery. We can't yeah. delete the avocados. We want to keep the number of, of, uh, of avocados, right? Because we need to double them. We need to know what... Um, you know what the number of, of avocados currently is. So, to go back real quick to what would happen if this code were allowed to compile and allowed to run, why is why would that be a bad thing? Well, we're iterating through pantry here. We're going through, and you can picture in memory. The pantry is out there in memory. You got you know first item here, the second item here, the third item here. We're iterating through. We're looking up in memory and saying, okay, what about this one right here? On line nine, when we call uh, pantry.push, pushing an item onto a vector may cause that, ve ve uh, that vector to completely reallocate its memory. Because we, we said vectors grow in memory. How that works is vectors first like allocate a big chunk of memory, fill that memory, and when, they're, when the vector is completely full and they need even more memory, they just allocate an entirely new chunk of memory and copy the data uh, over. So if we were able to do this right here, we might, we might actually end up uh, reallocating the memory where, where the number of avocados lives. And this memory might end up becoming deallocated and might be freed. And this might be junk memory. We might actually end up with a use after free bug. Uh, if we do this, because pantry has been completely reallocated because of this call to push right here. Right. So effectively, the Rust compiler is preventing us from a use after free 
bug that is completely possible and very subtle. Like you could write this code in C++ and not really realize that you are causing a use after free, but this is a use after free bug being prevented right here. And it only happens if the pantry happens to be the right size and um, you know the memory allocation happens to work in a certain way. So this would maybe, you know, in our example, maybe it would happen, maybe it wouldn't happen. Maybe it only happens in certain testing conditions and production when we're running our pantry in production here. Um, it might only happen every once in a while. This is a very subtle bug that, that Rust is preventing us from. Thank you, Rust. Again, good guy, Rust. <laughs> Coming to right. our rescue. Um, so mute iter can iterate over uh, a, a changing pantry. Well, it actually, it actually can, um, and we'll see how uh, it can do that in just a second. Cool. So do we still have errors? I don't, have we fixed everything, right? We still have this error. We haven't fixed the error of how to get, we, we can just, we can comment this out, but of course that changes our logic, right? We want- I saw I fix all my errors. I just yeah. comment the code out. <laughs> yeah. So we don't want to do that. But you pointed to what if, what happens if we go ahead and change this line here like that? And lo and behold, our code compiles now. Why does it do that? Because Rust is smart enough to say that we have, are borrowing pantry mutably all the way up to line nine, where we actually mutate the number of, avo uh, the number of avocados here. So we're changing the number of avocados here, and then we're done. We don't need, we're not, we don't, we can stop that borrow of uh, this, the borrow that started right here. We can stop it after line nine, because line nine is where we actually needed that mutable borrow. Once we're done with that, the borrow that we started right here on line seven is done, and we can go ahead and mutate pantry once again using a different. So this the first borrow runs all the way through here, all the way, goes to here, goes to here. Rust says, okay, you you did everything you needed to do with that mutable borrow. We'll stop the first mutable borrow, and then we'll allow you to borrow pantry mutably again and push chips onto it here. So this goes ahead and compiles just fine. Nice. Well, um, like I said, Ryan has prepared, prepared six of these for us. Uh, and we've gone through two and it's already past the hour mark. So I think we'll stop there uh, and make a promise to everyone that is still on that we will do this again. We'll do the other examples. I sent the link to the uh, for the GitHub repo. Um, it has all the links that we share. And, and Ryan also, if you can't get enough of Ryan, he has an incredible YouTube channel uh, that covers a lot of other various Rust topics, not just when the code breaks, but building up projects and stuff like that. So let me see if I can find that link. Um, but then, yeah, we'll uh, do this again, I think, with the other examples. And now that you have access to the repo, maybe you could like bring them and try to fix them yourself. And then we'll see. Yeah. Maybe you'll get better, hey. better against us. Hey Corey, uh, there's there's one final question uh, from Patrick about the um, oh, I see. that I think would be really awesome to to finish with here. This is a, this is a great one. So isn't it bad practice to mutate the vector while you're iterating over it? Um, in many languages, you're discouraged from doing that because you get a concurrent uh, a concurrent modification error. Like you'll it'll throw an exception uh, in there. Um, in Rust, such an error is literally impossible to do. The code won't compile if you, uh, it will statically verify that you're not doing that. So this bad practice in Rust doesn't exist because if you did something bad like that, the compiler would fail to compile and your code wouldn't run in the first place. So if the compiler allows you to mutate something sort of while you're iterating over it, um, feel free. Like the compiler has your back, no worries. Nice. Yeah, and this is why one is the always the chat MVP. He's always ent answering the questions in the chat as well. So I love it, one. Please come to the next one as well. Uh, but yeah, like you said, so we'll, we'll stop there. Like you said, it's a good time. And uh, we'll start there next time um, around that and like some of the, the best practices. But yeah, Perfect. stay tuned. We have a lot of lot more examples coming your way. So I'll send, I'll show this link one more time. It's got everything that we shared uh, as well as the module, the network, the matchmaking page, 
and the repo for the code examples. But yes, Ryan, thanks for joining us. And yes, we'll we'll do this again with the other examples. Thanks, everyone. Thank thanks you so for much. your answers. And I will, uh, pro again, I will deliver on those handshakes that you all received. <laughs> Have a good one, everyone.